Well, uh, Hong Kong is very fascinating to me because it is the um, confluence, the junction of East and West. One never knew before Hong Kong became such an important place what would happen when you mix Western capitalism with Chinese capitalism. And it's just sprung up like a tremendous mushroom or almost no equal in the world. Here in Hong Kong, I think you witness the tremendous explosion of Chinese enterprise. Kenneth Lowe left his native China over 50 years ago and has been successfully you know, colonizing Britain ever since. You have that. <laughs> I got too many pile up now. From his arrival in London in 1936, he has sold a million Chinese prints, written over 30 books on Chinese cookery, fronted a television series, and opened his own restaurant called Memories of China. In Chinese, dim sum uh, means uh, a touch of the heart. Really, it's something that warms the cockles of the heart. A small eats, they're all small eats. But now in Europe, uh, or America, it's become very popular now because they are very useful to use a, a starter to a big meal. But this dim sum banquet is our starter to a very big journey. 3,000 miles up the coast of China, by road, rail and sea, to Beijing, in the company of food and wine writers, Grand Masters du Vin, gourmets and gourmands, plus a few ordinary tourists. And snacks are never very expensive. Not like Chinese restaurants, can be very expensive, uh, like ours. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, dim sum is always very cheap. But the chefs are very expensive, aren't they, for dim sum? That's why the, not many restaurants uh, serve dim sum, because they can't afford to have expensive chefs and uh, serve cheap dishes. Hong Kong is the most popular starting point for visits to the People's Republic of China, and tourists usually fly to Canton or take the train through the new territories. But there is a third way, used by returning overseas Chinese, on the twice-weekly boat to Xiamen. And that's the way we're going. Kenneth, now in his 75th year, is going home to visit the China of his youth, to relive his memories. Kenneth is accompanied by one of his daughters, Jenny, and his wife, Anne. This tour was really to, to take Kenneth home, to make him write his um, life story. That was the original idea. Then came the idea of food and scenery in China today. Um, and it's gone from there. It seems to have got a lot bigger than I expected. Actually, the food attracted me to this one. A gastronomic tour I thought there might be some amusing wines about, but fundamentally it was to eat my way through China. <laughs> Are you particularly interested in the unusual foods of China? Yes. There's many peculiar, weird and wonderful things that I can lay my hands on in the next three weeks. What have you eaten in the past that would rate as an unusual dish? Oh, anything from uh, disgusting things like live white mice and things, you know, and uh, monkey's brains. Where did you eat Horrible, those? actually. Beastly. I wouldn't do it again, but uh, an interesting experience. I'm not sure how far I've advanced from the end of the sixth happiness um, in my ability to be sort of really realistic about China at all. I'm hoping to get a completely different view of an enormous civilization. Do you think the wine's going to be any good? Well, we tried one downstairs. We couldn't read the label, but we'll remember the taste. And if it's like that, we won't be on the wine for very long. The last couple of days, I've felt a bit sort of fragile. What are they? So it's the Po Chai pills. They deal with everything which I'm likely to suffer from. Diarrhea, indigestion, intoxication, fever, overeating, and gastroenteritis. You take about 40 every two hours. You're supposed to put them under your tongue. I tried putting them under my tongue, but I was choking with these things and unable to talk to anybody. So I've swallowed a lot, and I've sw I knocked them back with the unnameable, unmentionable, disgusting wine, in fact. It seemed a fairly good thing to do with it.
Well, very nearly there, lad, Kenneth. Yeah, it's the first time I've seen the coastline of China. Actually, approaching the coastline of the Fukien province. On uh, the other side is the Kuomai Islands. The Chinese called Qingmen, occupied by the Jiang Kai-shek nationalists. And over this side is the mainland. They've been lobbing shells at each other. It's only two or three miles apart. Uh, on alternate days for years, uh, because of the strain on the Taiwan Strait between the nationalist communists. But now it's all quiet on the eastern front. I think the Chinese have realized that uh, it's better not so much to make war, it's all to make money together. This is a statue of Chen Chenggong, one of the few uh, local heroes. And he was the first conqueror of uh, Taiwan and the last defender of the Ming Dynasty. And uh, there are lots of uh, temples uh, built in, in his uh, memory throughout this part of the province and throughout Taiwan too. Behind him here is the Gulongyi Island, which is mainly a residential island. And that was going to be built into a more extensive tourist center, especially uh, with uh, Amoy, old shaman, being twin with Cardiff. Island used to be jointly administered by the British and the Chinese. And my uncle was, in fact, the magistrate here for 15 years. And it's an island known nowadays as the island of 500 pianos. A great many concert pianists of China actually come from here. Look at the two women wallowing in the mud. I used to do that myself. Uh, in the mud, you could find little fish, little crabs, cockles and winkles and all kinds of things. It's quite great fun as a kid. Musical taste seem to be changing in China too. So are the musical instruments. Some of these instruments were forbidden, but now they are welcomed. Many of these have been imported from Taiwan and Japan. Three miles east of the town centre, on the slopes of the Wulao mountain, lies the Nanbutao temple, a Buddhist monastery with a thousand years history. At the time of the Cultural Revolution, all Chinese religions, ancestor worship, Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Christianity and Islam, were all declared superstition. Thousands of temples were ransacked or destroyed the monks were sent out to work in the fields. Today, the declared policy 
is one of religious tolerance. Enshrined in temples have been repaired. The extent of the restoration is quite impressive. The figure Wei Tao, the deity responsible for the Buddhist doctrine, carries a staff. If it points to the ground, it means that the monastery is rich and a weary traveller will be refreshed with food and drink. If horizontal, he must push on again. Luckily for us, he's pointing to the ground, and so we are to enjoy a vegetarian banquet. This is the first dish. It consists of different things. It's mainly the, a colorful presentation uh, to uh, welcome the honored guests. And this uh, particular uh, lady chef is the best, most famous uh, vegetarian chef in China. She has cooked for Deng Xiaoping, who has visited this place, as well as Deng Yinchao, which is Madame Zhou Anlai. And they all thought this was great. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I discovered we've now had only three dishes. I've counted about 11, but I'm, I'm told there are only three and about 10 to go. I, the, the, I love the names. Glittering Lotus from the South Seas. What a name for a dish. The name of this dish is Half Moon Sinking in the River. It's, it's made of a winter mushroom with uh, gluten and bamboo shoots. There is a certain ingredient, medicinal ingredient, which, according to them, makes it an extremely nourishing dish. And its title again? We call it Delicious Cream Taro in Fragrance. Marvelous. What's the taro? Mmm. It's wonderful. I wanted to film them too. I like the flavors of the, sea, the two seaweeds that we've had, the very black one and this, this green one. And the textures are very different, which is, is so much interesting about Chinese food in particular, not just a vegetarian dish. I think it's wonderful. The title of this dish is Drizzles in the, go, in the Lonely Cloud. That's all. Drizzles. This dish is called the Amoy Flower in clear gravy. And one thing about this particular chef is that her dishes are all based on a, a poetical conception, rather than imitations of non-vegetarian dishes, which are famous, like ducks. The Chinese are always making ducks and fish and all that kind of thing. And that's what distinguishes her. She's always based on a poetical concept. This dish is colorful threads with golden buttons. This is called the hot toss rice flour noodles of the um, Namputao Monastery. Because of the long strands of it, it meant to uh, reflect uh, longevity. You eat it and you live forever. on the roads in China, you notice they're not only flooded with bicycles, but it's also heavy with motorized traffic. There's much greater mobility in China now. A lot of people come to town to see what's new, to see the overseas Chinese coming in and the Western tourists pouring in too. These country women are typical of the ethnic minority. They're given special protection and privileges by the government.
Fujian is a mountainous province, but a great deal of rice is grown in the valleys. There are good tracts of land, great tracts of land, which are very fertile, capable of three or four crops a year. But the great, one great disadvantage of rice growing is that the paddy fields are ideal breeding ground with mosquitoes. In the summertime, you have enormous flocks of mosquitoes homing in on you. We've come to the Jime school. I never realized before that Jime is such a huge educational complex. It's got uh, kindergartens, schools, colleges, and even the university. And this was all established by the philanthropist Tankaki. It's a total number of pupils of over 24,000. No wonder when I used to play them in sports, we always found them so extremely strong. They're far greater in number than we were in Fu Chao. Ask, ask, uh, ask the guide of Shushu how to eat it. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, no, he's going to prepare you one. Oh, he thinks you are. need it more stripped off, I think. Well, I think he's right, too. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I don't know what you're doing. I think we need to come back. Right. Yeah. Now eat that. Oh, too late. Charles is eating that. <laughs> What's it like, Charles? Mm. Very good. Very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, you're dribbling. <laughs> <laughs> Quick critique on that. It's sweet. Very sweet. Oh, oh. Are you supposed to do that? Yes, I think so. Huh? You can't eat all the fibre. It's full of fibre. Absolutely lovely juice. No, later, later. My great grandfather had over 30 children, and today you're only allowed just one. This policy is not strictly enforced, but it's quite evident. And children nowadays are wearing brightly colored clothes as compared to dull. Mal suits of ten years, even ten years ago. They are visiting the tomb of Tankaki, whose generosity set up this village of schools. He was born in 1874 and was, like so many of his generation, forced by poverty to seek his fortune abroad. His tomb, which he designed himself, depicts his life. You see, this area is full of monuments to Chinese who went abroad, and they sent money back home to build bridges and even blocks of flats. The overseas Chinese wealth pours back into this province, making it one of the richest areas in China today. When you have such a large number of students and pupils congregated in a limited area, the food is never enough to appease the hunger. And to some extent, even in my school days, we went out to eat all around the school with their cafes and street stalls. And uh, then you can enjoy a far greater variety of uh, food than you normally supply by the school dining halls. And uh, when we had ever used to have some pocket money, we'll go to them and have, especially in this area, all kinds of seafoods. and they bring them in so fresh, as you can see, uh, the fish all around. And so everything is fresh, and when it's stir-fried, it only takes a few seconds or minutes. And uh, you have pretty good food at a very reasonable price. And we really make a pick up ourselves. Mm. 
it a little bit further. Huh? You should have another bottle of this wine, too. <laughs> or this beer. Mm, this beer. Yeah. Yeah, like it's a lot safer to we drink it out of the yeah, bottle, actually. Yeah. It's cool right. to you put in a mountain of oysters, right? Yeah. Yeah. You must have put in about 60 oysters. There wasn't mean on the oyster. Yeah. Just kept on pouring them in. <laughs> well, even if we get hepatitis, there's a pleasure getting it. You <laughs> <laughs> think it was a worthy cause? <laughs> Complication seems to arise out of the two types of money used in China now, especially with tourists. The um, foreign exchange vouchers, which are given to the tourists, are worth more. But here, locally, the uh, shopkeepers are not used to handling the foreign exchange. So they're asking for the ordinary people's money. Especially this first part of the trip, Hong Kong, I thought was very, very interesting, and I was ready for that. But this part of the trip, where we're almost the first group of tourists ever to visit, is absolutely fascinating. I'm absolutely fascinated, and it's strange, but people seem to be fascinated by us. It's difficult, difficult to get adjusted to, but very marvelous. Are you enjoying this exciting ride? Uh, I'm, l I'm uh, doing a bit of backseat driving. I'm not too happy about the way the driver will insist on overtaking on uh, blind hills. I do find it slightly alarming, but he seems extremely confident, so I'm trusting him. Well, thankfully, we have arrived at this ancient town of Chuanzhou in one piece, and at this surprisingly modern hotel. It's a town well known to Marco Polo. It's from here that he sailed back to Europe after 19 years' service in the Imperial Court in Peking. The port has now been silted up, so nobody could sail from here to anywhere. It seems that for Chuanzhou's 140,000 inhabitants, there are 140,000 bicycles, but interestingly, only 20 cars. That's a tricycle hearse on its way to collect its freshly filled coffin. One thing which Marco Polo noticed was that there's quite a big Muslim population in Chuanzhou. The seal is today, and this is one of China's oldest mosques. It's a beautiful town and also boasts two 700-year-old pagodas, reckoned to be among the finest in China. Uh, 
apparently, we are the first large party of Westerners ever to visit the town. And the photographer on the Tranjo paper is on hand to record the event. We were even taken into an old house to meet the family. When we arrived at bath time, and the toddler, who just finished his bath, didn't take kindly to being put back in the game, just to please the round eyes with the camera. And this, this market's every single day, is it? Oh, yes. Uh, you see, they start very early in the morning uh, at uh, 4 o'clock, and where the fresh produce all come in. And that's why we heard such an enormous sub hubbub this morning. And that's glutinous, glutinous rice. Can you see those writings on the wall there? Yeah. What it says is that this is a civilized market, and let's keep it that way. <laughs> Now then, what have we got here? Dim sum? Well, some of these are charcuteries, if you like. You know, cooked fish balls, and some are meat balls, and some kind of Chinese sausage. Very similar to what you see in Europe, really. Mm -hmm. But these have been better to deep fry. And this is, these are uh, moors, is right? Uh, uh, <laughs> this is a uh, wood ear that grows on trees. Oh, the mushroom? Yes, the mushroom, mushroom yeah. mm. There's not much smell, but it's, more, it's got a lot of texture to that. What's this grass-like stuff here? Take us over down here. This is chow. Um, oh, this is seaweed. Yeah? Smell it. Mmm. This is good. Eat it. Oh, this is going to be put in the spring roll. Ah, yeah. Right. Poor little. Seems a shame to eat them, eh? Yeah. Unusual colour, those crabs. They're red crab. They happen only in this area of the southeast coast of China. Nowhere else in the world. And uh, it's got a special flavour. Most Chinese appreciate it just because it tastes somewhat different. You know? These uh, scallops are called pang. Pang? Uh, yes. It's a very large scallop. And when we cook to have them eaten, we just pour boiling water on it, have it poached. And that's why, so that uh, there's more juice and greater tenderness, so long as they're not cooked properly. The very best seafood taste, better than any scallop available anywhere else in the world. You see, they don't treat the uh, oysters with the same respect as in England, you see. No, they show them all. They show them, yes, I don't know why. That's why they're often made of the omelets, the stir fry of the egg. They don't just have a What's it called? Well, that's what they cook into the lion's head fish. They are, they're deep fried, but the meat is cut off first, except for the head part, you see. So you pile the piece of meat behind after cooking it and dress up the head of the fish. That's why it's called the lion's head fish. You see how big the bamboo shoots are? The bamboo shoots are very large. Most people think they're small. You see the big bamboo shoots? Mm -hmm. Enormous size. And that's so popular in England today, in Monch too. The Monch too, yes. Yeah. This is something between um, spring onion and chives. I think we'll hurry past this. It all looks a bit grisly with these ducks' yes, heads. Yes, yes, I think, yes. I'm never so fond of the meat section. Oh, dear. Yeah, they're all sitting waiting. Oh, dear. It does seem rather cruel to make them sit amongst all this butchery. Coming here, we read it uh, treading um, in the footsteps of Marco Polo uh, 500 years ago. Because when he came south, after having served 19 years with the great Khan, Genghis Khan and 
country from. Uh, he was going home this way, and he stopped in uh, Hangzhou and Quanzhou. And the thing which impressed him more than anything else was the Chinese markets. And exactly what we heard this morning, what we're seeing today. We're on the way to Fuzhou. And uh, in my time, hardly any of us who lived in Fuzhou used to come down here because this was bandit infested country, sort of no-go area. And uh, what I noticed is that people could hardly speak the Fuchao dialect, even though this is no more than 20, 30 miles from Fuchao. But nowadays, it's almost like the M1 of the China coast. And uh, we are fast approaching my hometown, which I left 54 years ago. I think I've always been away too long to feel acutely uh, any great nostalgia. What seems most noticeable in half a century is that everything is much crowded. There are far more buildings around than when I was living here. And some of these buildings look like the old ones I used to know, because most of the houses here were timber built. The upriver here, Ming River, is one of the few forested areas in South China. The city has become much more industrialized than before, and much broader streets. The street, these streets used to be only about one third this width, and there were no bicycles then, and they're not paved flat roads like these. They, they were uh, single lane uh, pathways paved with stone, and you can't even pull a rickshaw over it. So they have simply to walk or ride in sedan chairs. Really? There was one of the greatest snow in, the, oh, it's cold. in your yeah. country. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Next time you come you in the yeah. You see, he's a, um, on the uh, International Conference of Sea Levels, how to maintain sea level. So he was, he was in London. Just a few weeks. No, no, no. no. Just you were, you yeah, were yeah, yeah, He's a physics pro professor. Yeah. And all these uh, uh, gentlemen, about my time, or just after my time, you see, we're all getting somewhere in these days. Yeah. Uh, well, they represent the alumni association. The alumni association oh, of the Anglo Chinese College. Oh, yeah. He is the uh, um, chairman of the Fukien. Culinary Association. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So Fuchao is becoming a tourist place too. Yeah, there is. Yeah, you have a lot of people now. A whole crowd of people down there digging up the bottom of the canal on a Sunday morning. And this community work is partly to clean the canal and partly also to obtain the mud as fertilizers to use in their market garden. Oh. 
I'm on my way to look at my old college and passing familiar landmarks, but many of them have gone. The Fu Chao Club is gone, the British Consulate is gone, uh, even the tennis court's not there anymore. And the only thing that remains, which could be seen, which is exactly the same as it used to be, is the Ming River. He is studying the general subject, you see, exactly what I studied, you know, at, at that period in 19, that was 1931, 1331. And uh, in the heat of summer, you've got to do three exams, all of them having a 12 to 13 subjects, and all concentrated at the end of June, early part of July. It's the same uh, system today? Well, it's fairly similar. In the end, it's very similar. But the one thing we don't study now here is that uh, we used to have a Guomindang subject called the Three People's Principle. Anyhow, to take Saminyongi. Here's Another landmark of Fuzhou, which hasn't changed at all since my time, is the Drum Mountain. The peak is about 3,000 feet up, and uh, it came to be called the Drum Mountain because the rain hitting the top of the boulder seemed to create the sound of a drum. And so three quarters of the way up is the Yunchen Monastery, one of the biggest in South China. This monastery is to house three or four thousand monks. China now, one thing is happening. Not only there are tourists from abroad, but the Chinese themselves are moving around in vast halls to visit places which they've read about or heard about but never been before. Nowadays, of course, far more Chinese are coming up here because you can drive up here. In my days, you actually walk up and climb on stone steps for about four hours before you get up to this height. One of the functions of the monastery is not only to act as a sanctuary for people, but also a sanctuary of all living things. For example, there's a pond, the fish ponds, where the fish are brought there and to live the natural length of life. And outside them, there are also sanctuaries for cattle and ducks and geese all left there to live the natural length of life. People are supposed to come here to do good things to all living things. But my grandmother used to come here and put the guilt on the huge Buddhas inside. That also is considered a good deed. So certainly your stay in this city is a very short one. And tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon you are going to leave for Hanchao. So it's my hope that you will get another chance to come to the city. To conclude, I wish all of you a happy stay in China. The Chinese are no great drinkers, except when it comes to banquets. To start with, you have three different drinks, all on the go at the same time. Beer, wine, and the stuff that toasts are made of. Chinese spirit. And you're supposed to doubt it in one. Tastes good? Um, yes. <laughs> It's uh, it's not the same as yesterday's. It's I can feel it's uh, oh god, my eyes are watering. It's you know I can feel the sort of heat going down one's uh, throat. 
Uh, is it smart tie again? Or is it different? Yeah, it's different. Why? It's got two kanju. Which means what? Well, it's made of sorghum. It's just a and name. the dukang means sorghum. Well, millet, sorghum millet. Yeah. And ju means wine. That's true. Does that mean that wine, wine means any sort of alcoholic drink, does it? Yeah, in Chinese, means wine and liquor as well. Fujian cooking may not be one of the major cuisines of China, but it's got many distinctive qualities. One is the use of seafood, making fish balls, and also the use of those skin wrappings made of meat. And they often use wine quite heavily in, in their stir fry cooking. What is the red cook part of this drunken chicken? Uh, <laughs> well, how do, how do you say this? Uh, it's a ground up pepper. Now, just the, the leftover of the wine, you use the rice. Oh, the leaves, oh, okay. leaves of the, the right. rice oh, wine. Right. I right. see. Oh. Is, it, is it kept in earthenware jars or something for a long time? So it's oxidized, it's like sherry. Well, I think so, it's because so but in China, all the rice wine I eat this color. God, I drink a lot more of that. It's like, it's like dry chocolate. It's going to taste like chocolate, like cocoa, but no sugar. It's very dry. It's rather good. And then just deep fry it. Could somebody find out what these are, please? It looks like melted piano cheese. No, I can't cook that. Yesterday it was cut up into little pieces. This is jellyfish. Jellyfish? Which? This bit? Yes. So that's jellyfish. And what is this? This is called part of the jellyfish. Yes. Look at this. This is part of the jellyfish. I have found the only thing I do not like. Part of the cat and all the tail. Uh -huh. I think, yes, one has to try things once John. in a lifetime, and I think... Do you want my jelly fish? Yes, that's the way I I've tried this, I've had this before. It's this stuff. I mean, it's... it's you put it into your mouth, and it, you should make it into sort of... I don't know, it's... It's strange, it's strange. Like, it's, like it's like a sort of rubber glove, a solid rubber glove. <laughs> you don't like jelly fish. This brings back childhood memories of the most utter terror. And I, I may have to leave the room. <laughs> please, please try it again. But it's There's rancid. Somehow. It's the most revolting I mean, flavor. I don't know how to it No, so this jellyfish is absolutely delicious. It's crunchy. Mm. It's crisp. It's got. What? That, yes, but what is this? We're yeah, still looking. Cuttlefish. Or inkfish, whatever. Inkfish. Yeah. Inkfish. Black cuttlefish. I see. Stewed, braised for a very, very long time. Red braised, right? Yeah. How was the jellyfish killed? Red braised. Uh, How was it killed? <laughs> oh, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a morbid complex tonight. No, I'm, I'm just, I was thinking ahead to my own demise at the end of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I got my they drown them in wine, you know. <laughs> the next morning, complete with hangover, we resume our search for Kenneth's past. His old house is no more, the building replaced by a barracks but the gardens remain. Well, Hillary, I'm actually surprised that this tree is still standing so prosperous. I just looked out my window every day and saw this tree. And it is now a protected tree under the Fu Chao Forestry Preservation Order. And this was on record having been planted in 1840. And now it's 33 meters high and nearly just under one meter thick. <laughs> it's compared with this. I'm actually a young man. And uh, we used to have two other trees of equal height, but they're so easy to scale that we built a tree house up there. And sometimes you stay a half a day up the tree and uh, have a picnic on top, even slept on top of the tree, and nearly, you know, 40, 50 feet up in the tree. You couldn't climb this one? This one we can't climb. There's nothing to climb on, you see. But it's actually surprising to find it so thick and so prosperous and under preservation. I hope to come back another 60 years and take a little look at it. Our old house, it was nothing less than a huge mansion with 25 rooms at least. We used to have a dozen or 27s and uh, three or four rickshaws and sedan chairs. And we've got quite a garden in front. In the back we had the high trees, but in front we have pomelo trees, which grow these grapefruit-like fruits. But i never seen our new house where we moved to after we dished out from our old mansion. 
And that's where we're going now. Oh, it's in the car. We bring it to the motel. So yes, <laughs> you can get the present. Nice to see you. Mm. Oh, here they are. Hello, nice to meet you. Yeah, that's a suk. Suk. And Irene. 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 Yeah. Actually, this stuff doesn't seem all that bad. It seems rather slummy. Oh, yeah. Uh, it it looks like it's not slummy. This would be a suitable house in St. John's Wood. And over there is the tomb, a uh, burial ground of the, uh, the whole family. Over here? Yeah, you see up there. Uh, it says here, the tomb of... Um, Mr. Lord Tai Pu of the, Man of the Manchu dynasty, because he was ambassador, not the Republican days, of the Manchu dynasty. And in fact, uh, my, both my parents were uh, buried under here. Yes, and my uncles too, you see. They, they were all scattered all over the suburban hills, but uh, now they're all being dug out because they don't want, they really want to use every piece of ground for cultivation, growing more rice. So we got all our ancestors gathered together and buried <laughs> in the urns. Under here, oh, in urns. In urns, oh, in urns. In urns. Oh, in urns. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Not burns, yeah. it's sort of rock. Yeah. Oh. Uh, all right, all right. And I think I just, just burn it, and I just burn once like this. It's hard to work. That's it. The next day, we're to take our first train journey, and it's a big one, 24 hours. Although it's not that far to our next destination, Hanjo, the mountainous country forces the train to follow the Min River inland to avoid the Wihi Range. And what a train it is. Drawn by a vast steam locomotive of the March Forward class, which was only built in 1984 at Datong, China still makes over 400 steam trains every year. The 3,000 horsepower it produces is needed to drag the 14 coaches uphill for the first eight hours by way of a single track with strategic passing points. relax in beautiful frilly compartments and gaze in wonder at the views as our stately dragon takes us up the majestic Min River. We've only covered about a third of our journey so far and Beijing 
is still 2,000 miles away. <laughs> 